can you give that which you do not have? Thank God for grace. But it is safer to be on the Lord's side. Sanctify them how? Through thy truth. Come on. Thy word is truth. May God bless us. coming to church this morning and you were thinking you know to let tell us who is our preacher today um, or maybe you were worrying about will I have a seat in the church today uh, whatever questions you had as you are coming to church or probably uh, will we have uplifting uh, music in the church. I don't know what your questions were, or maybe as you were sitting here, you were saying, when I go home, will there be power for me to warm my lunch? All those probably are genuine uh, concerns, but do you know, my friends, that while we may have those trivial uh, questions on Sabbath, there are people who, when they come to church, they are asking themselves, are we going 
to end our service without a police pouncing on us. Are you aware there are people somewhere who are concerned about whether they will be able to keep their child in school because of what, what is obtaining where they live? That is why once in a year, as a church, we have a day that has been dedicated to celebrate religious liberty. And this is the day. Our theme for the day is champions of freedom and love. Champions of freedom and love. Uh, we will go this direction and the other Bible studies are going to come under that theme, and so I invite you to come back in the afternoon for more. This morning, we will hit a number of themes that relate uh, to that topic, but come back in the afternoon. Amen? Amen. Champions of freedom and love. What does that mean, Pastor? It simply means we are the ambassadors. Hallelujah, somebody. We are the advoc advocates, we are the champions, we are the channels God is going to use to bring about liberty and lift him up as one who loves us. Amen. Amen. Here is the issue though. Your self-understanding, the conception of who you are, has a bearing on how you treat yourself and how you treat other people. Did you hear me? The way you take and understand yourself somehow will have a bearing on how you treat yourself and how you treat other people. So if we are to be effective and faithful champions of freedom and love, we ought to know who we are. Hallelujah, somebody. I read in Luke, what chapter did I say, everybody? Luke is not a chapter. <laughs> Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter what, everybody? Luke chapter 4. Let's begin to read on verse 16 through to 21. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written. Are we still together? Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and yet the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So, as he begins his assignment, as he begins his ministry, he has this conviction, his understanding, I am anointed of the Lord. Hallelujah, somebody. I am chosen, I have a mission to release people. And throughout his life, he is going to live as such. The way he relates to people, I am here as a liberator. One chosen of God, one who came from on high. Amen? Amen? If you remember, when he is baptized, he goes into the wilderness face to face with the enemy. The enemy is going to try and dissuade him and, 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 and confuse his focus. 
So he will tempt him and he says, uh, if you are the son of God. Remember, the question is on his identity. If you are the son of God, turn the stones into bread. What did he say? Man shall not live by bread alone. I have nothing to prove. It is a fact. I know it to be true because daddy told me. I am the beloved of the father. He knew who he was. You follow me? He, you could not intimidate him anyhow. Chapter 19 of the book of John. Is it verse uh, 10 and 11? He is before Pilate. He has been arrested. And Pilate is interrogating him. And he says, where are you from? Who are you? He does not answer. Pilate is unhappy. He says, you don't answer me? Don't you know that I have power to release you or to crucify you? You know what he said? You would have. You would not have that power. Had it not been given by you. In other words, I know who I am. You cannot intimidate me. I know you are here and your power is limited. Christ knew who he was. He lived and he died to set people free. Amen. But then he says in chapter 20 of the book of John, as the father sent me, Saul, I am also sending you. So who are there to release people? Who are there to show the love of the father? We are the people. Hallelujah, somebody. Hence, our subject, champions of freedom and love. But the question is, who are we? How should we think of ourselves? What attitude should I adopt towards myself? Those are questions we must answer. The way we will treat people depends on who we think we are, consciously or unconsciously. Depending on who you are going to ask or the sources you are going to consult, where you are going to look for answers, I mean, for, for these questions, your answers will be different. You may actually end up concluding you are a nobody. Are you listening to me? Depending on where you go for your answers or your frame of reference, you may end up concluding you are a nobody. And sometimes those conclusions are as a result of how you were brought up. If you had a deprived childhood, your feelings were dismissed, your answers were despised, you end up believing you are a mistake and you are a nobody. And sometimes it is because of the experiences of rejection and, and betrayal. You have been divorced. All your parents are, are going through a tough and nasty divorce. You are traumatized and you end up concluding you are a nobody. Or maybe you were the breadwinner, Pastor Kazia. And all of a sudden you wake up and you find yourself, you are now HH. And by that I mean a house husband. <laughs> Out of employment. <coughs> that too can be a challenge. Or is it old age? You were able to get around and do all you wanted on your own, but now you must be su supported and sometimes driven to some places. That can also be a challenge. Let's talk about discrimination based on your race, your tribe, your gender. Those also be can be quite humiliating. Before you know it, you lose all the confidence in yourself. You are a nobody. Or well, maybe because you are consulting wrong sources. Are you with me this morning? Now to push 
to push back against this rampant disease for low self esteem there is a whole movement and they call it a a a, a human potential movement hallelujah somebody the proponents tell us be yourself look in the mirror and love yourself and celebrate yourself express yourself fulfill yourself they emphasize the power of positive thinking positive mental attitude possibility thinking in the end you are left with an impression is it true that human beings have an unlimited potential for development because sometimes you are left to believe that somehow as human beings we have this intrinsic goodness in us so love yourself i have heard some can i go ahead and share i have heard some who say actually the bible tells us to love ourselves the second commandment says the second great commandment that's what we call it the second great commandment says love your neighbor is as you love yourself the interpretation there is if you don't love yourself you'll not be able to so it begins with see loving your so we go to that passage and we find the justification commendation for self-love but here's the problem someone said tell us pastor here is the what here is the challenge the bible is not saying love your neighbor and love yourself also it says love your neighbor as you love your self meaning the insertion of us in the commandment is simply giving us a practical guide for neighbor love are we together uh, it is almost a what do you call it a golden the golden what does it say do to other people what you want them to to do to you there is no commendation in the bible for self love it is not there what you find there we are being told this is a fact to be recognized that you love yourself you follow me uh, paul says no man hates himself so it is a fact to be recognized and a rule to be applied towards neighbor love and then not a virtue to be commended are we together so where pastor are we going to get the basis for human i mean our self affirmation how should we look at ourselves how can we renounce the extremes of self love and also self hatred so that we don't despise ourselves or flatter ourselves where can you can we go romans chapter 12 and verse 3 paul says think of yourself with sober judgment or sober minds there is only one place i know and that is the cross of jesus that will supply the answer to how we must understand ourselves hallelujah somebody because the cross calls us both to self denial and also self affirmation and that is what i call the paradox of the cross let's talk about self denial look chapter 9 what book did i say everybody look chapter 9 and i am reading verse 23 here is what the bible says if anyone wishes to come after me he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me if anyone will come after me he must do what everybody 
deny himself, then take up the cross, and follow me. Self-denial is where we begin in our followership of the Savior. The same book, chapter 14, and verse 27. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. If you do not deny yourself, carry your own cross, you cannot be a disciple of Jesus the Christ. The question is, Pastor, what does it mean to carry the cross? What does it mean to carry the cross? I'm glad you ask. Because generally, what I hear, if you have had some lingering illness that is not going away, we will say, I have been on the cross for too long. Or maybe you have a haughty tempered spouse at home. That is the cross. Or maybe you have some unpredictable employer, the boss. You just don't know what they're going to demand tomorrow. That is the cross. I am not talking about a wayward son who keeps you awake at night. Now, these may be challenges of life. Are you listening to me? And probably may be the tools God will use to work on ourselves. But that is not the cross he is asking us to carry. In the Roman Empire, if a person was condemned to the death of the cross, he was actually required to carry the cross himself to the place of execution. If not the whole thing, at least the beam carried to the place where you were going to be killed. You remember when Jesus was arrested and they are dragging him to Golgotha? They grabbed the man on the way to carry what he should have carried because he was too weak to carry it. If you were a condemned person to die on the cross, you carried your own cross. The Lord is saying, if you will follow me, if you are going to be my disciple, carry your own cross. What is he talking about? To carry the cross here simply means to put yourself into the position of a condemned rebel who is on his way to execution. To follow Jesus with a cross on your shoulder it takes you to simply one place. It is the place of execution. Therefore, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is right. When he says, when Christ calls a man, he beats him, come and die. The cross we carry is not a hot-tempered wife or husband. The cross we carry are not the challenges of life. The cross we carry is not a lingering illness that is not going away. The cross we carry is a symbol of death to self. Before that happens, we cannot be effective, effective disciples of Jesus. It is to deny yourself, to renounce your right to go it your own way. It is to turn away from the idolatry of self centeredness or self-worship you cannot be an effective champion of freedom and love before there is a death to self pastor if the bible is calling us to deny ourselves by the way the word that is being used here deny yourself it's the same way that is used in, the, in Peter's denial of the master. Renouncing, I never, I never knew him. That is the point we have to come. Renounce yourself and your rights to do things your own way. Because you have another master. Amen. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. I said this morning, every bird of us, before we get into the kingdom of heaven, we must not only be a Barabbas, we must also be a Simon of Cyrene. Amen, somebody? We have escaped the cross. 
like Barabbas because somebody else died on there. But after that, there is a cross carrying that must be part of our lives if we are to be faithful to the master. Amen? So now, what is the basis of self-affirmation? I want to suggest to you the basis of self-affirmation is in our value in the sight of God. Amen. Now, guess what? That is why people are equal in this world. Because that which matters, that which is really the basis of human dignity, of human value, is available to everybody. What we do, what we have, our educational attainments, our positions in sight may put us in classes. But the true value of a human being, the basis is available to everybody. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. Our self-affirmation, our true value is our value in the sight of God. And what does God say about human beings? What does God say about human beings? Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 26. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 12. And if you go there, the Bible is clear. It says you and I are worthy much more than the birds of the air and the beasts of the forest. We are much more important. We are much more valuable than the birds of the air and the beasts of the forest. Now look here. They were also created by God. How many of you are aware of that? Put up your hands. Someone say, I know, Pastor. They were all made by God. Can I say something more? We were made on the same day. Ah, you didn't hear me. You and the cow and the monkey and the he and, and God. Same day. But even with that, the Bible says we are much more important than the birds and also the animals. Now, that comparison in the Bible is made in the context of telling you never to worry. You hear me? He says, if I take care of all the birds of the air, if I am responsible for all the animals of the forest, and yet you are much more important than those, why should you worry? I don't know. We are just beginning the year. What, God, what, what, what the enemy is going to throw in your way. I don't know what you are dealing with right now, but the Bible is appealing. The Savior says, I care for you more than I care for the animals of the forest. Now, why is he saying human beings are more important than beasts and birds? Well, Genesis tells us we were actually created in the image of God, male and female, he made us in his own image. Oh, so pastor, what does that mean? God has a nose, eyes, black hair like us. I don't know who we'll discover when we get there. Hallelujah, somebody. But here's what I know. We have the capacity as human beings of relating to God intelligently. We make up our minds whether we are going to worship him or not. There is a dignity in people that is not in animals. Hallelujah, somebody. And that is based on the fact that because we are human, made in the image of God. You are listening to me? You cannot be bought because you were made in the image of God. If you realize, if we all walked knowing that black and white, Langes and the losses, Bembas and Nyanjas, Nyanja, we are all made in the image of God. There will be no room for discrimination. There 
there will be no room for abusers. There will be no room for manipulators. In fact, I have a theologian who actually says, when you abuse a human being, are you listening to me? One who is created in, in the image of God, you are as guilty as those people who sold in the temple and Jesus came and they whipped them out of the temple. Because the Bible somewhere says you are actually a temple of the Holy Spirit and God resides in you. Discrimination, abusing a human being made in the image of God is an affront against God himself. So, you know those people who you are supervising? Those people who are working for you? Those who you think are nobodies in your neighborhood? They are created in the image of God. You are not a disposable, listen to me. You are precious in the eyes of God. David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God says, you are much more important than birds and beasts because you were made in the image of God. Can I share something? A Negro boy protesting the abuse, dehumanizing treatment that he received from his white masters. He could not take it anymore. He, he made a poster. A what, everybody? He made a poster and he hung it by his bed. Here are the words on the poster. I am me. And I am good. Because God don't make junk. Now, Chizungu, you have questions about it. But the theology is impeccable. God don't make junk. Hallelujah, somebody. You know, when we were growing up, they were telling us a, 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 a how should I put this one so kindly and in a civilized way? A, a model woman is one with a Coca Cola, a bottle of what? Shape, something like that. Recently I heard it's one who, is, who has a guitar shape. Whatever that, a guitar shape. They, they keep on inventing. Whatever that means. And because of these uh, models we are given and, and, and we are busy dieting and you do all kinds of because I want to shave up. <laughs> it doesn't matter what your body size is. <laughs> you are a child of God. Amen. You were made in his image. Amen. And you are precious to God. Amen. Listen, even if you were the only sinner, the son of God was going to come here and die for you. Amen. And it is that reason that because he made us in his own image, we have the ability to decide whether to love him or never to love him, he will not allow any power. He will not allow anything to offend and violate that right. Because you are not like an animal to be bought, to be manipulated, to be sold. And that's why we should not accept it. I am not going to advocate divorce from the pulpit. But this idea that somebody's life is in danger. You are drinking and you are eating your tears every night. But simply because society has told us you must be married and you are staying. You are perpetuating and you are a supporter of abusers. You are special. You are precious in the eyes of God. Do not allow yourself to be a peace for somebody's use. My God tells me, I am more important than a beast or an animal. Because I was made in the image of God. Are you growing old? Are you losing all your teeth and your hair? You are still a child of God in his, in his image. 
Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. Our basis for self-affirmation is in the value that we have in the sight of God. And in his sight, we are his creation. We reflect his image. Yes, we have been in the fields of sin. Yes, we have let him down many times. But we have not lost his image. That's why he pursues you. That's why he follows you. To transform your life. Amen? Amen. Secondly, when Jesus was here himself, the attitude he had towards people, he despised nobody. He honored those who were despised and accepted those who were rejected. Amen. He spoke to women in public at a time when it was a taboo because to him there was neither Jew nor Gentile. There was no, neither man nor woman. All are equal in the presence of God. He welcomed children at a time when you were counting people, you would not even count women and children because they're not people. They're not human. He will say, let the children come unto me. He spoke to Gentiles. He spoke to Samaritans like human beings. That is my savior. Lepers were free to come to him. A prostitute, did you hear me? A what everybody? A prostitute, publicly. He came and anointed him and he also kissed him. Yes, I said kissed him. And the holy ones, what did I say? The chosen ones. In some corner, they are murmuring. What kind of a prophet is this? Who allows sinners to come to him. You know, I have a feeling that sometimes in our days, if Jesus came to some church, they will censure him. <laughs> they will actually put him on censure. Because, you know, he allowed no boundary to reach people. He would do stop at nothing to live up to his self-understanding. I am here as a liberator. I have come to set men free from the shackles of sin. I will allow no decree, no human perception or attitude to deter me along that mission. He was available to people. Finally, his death on the cross is the clearest indicator of the value that he puts on people. Amen. That is the clearest indicator. His willingness to pay that price. To die on the cross of Calvary. And so I say, it is only when we look at the cross that we see our true worthy and that of all human beings. We cannot go to the cross and they walk away with bigotry in our hearts. We cannot go to the cross and walk away with discrimination in our hearts. We can never go to the cross and walk away as abusers of people. It is impossible unless you have never been to the cross of Calvary. Because there, all men are created equal. There, all men are precious in his sight. William Temple said, My worthy is what I am worthy to God. And that is a marvelous, great deal. Amen. For Christ, he said. <laughs> My dear friends, and that is Paul, that's why Paul would say, it is for this self-understanding. It is for this freedom that I died for you. Therefore, allow yourself not to go back again to bondage. To these human definitions of who you are or what you must be, it is enough. I need no other 
evidence. Jesus died and rose for me. And that is enough for me. I therefore challenge you this morning. Go to the cross of Jesus. And your pride will be broken. And your guilt will be expunged. And our love is going to be kindled. And our hope is going to be restored. And our character are going to be transformed. Then and then only are we going to be able to be champions of freedom and love. That is my prayer for all of you. Amen.